Welcome to Circa. The Eternal City is where the ancient meets the modern. Art in Rome is special, odd, out of place, and totally in step. Even when it's obvious, it's stunning. I want to tell you about the places that are less obvious, but that makes them even more undeniable. With that in mind, we will be telling you a lot. But don't worry, there will be maps, notes, and info on the places mentioned in this episode in the Circa app. So just sit back, put your headphones on, and andiamo a scoprire l'arte. This is a Roman work of art. Circa. Love the world you live in and we'll help you explore it. Rome is an open-air exhibition. Film, sculpture, painting, artists here have influenced the history of the city massively. In this episode, I will show you how art, more than anything else, has shaped the city. In Rome, the past and the present are always blurring. When it comes to art, it is the past and the future which begin to melt. Modern art in Rome is unlike any other place because it is showcased with a backdrop of this ancient city. This is not a place where new buildings replace old ones. It is one where they learn to coexist. And the contrast is magic. Art shows in ancient buildings, contemporary international artists exhibiting in old villas covered in marble statues, pop photographers placing their pieces on ancient ruins. This is how Rome does art. You have heard of the Vatican Museums, the Colosseum and the Musei Capitolini. But there are some places that you may not have heard of. They are sometimes ostentatious, sometimes quirky, but always beautiful. This is one of my favorites. Galleria Borghese. The famous jellyfish looking pine trees of Rome welcome you into one of the city's biggest parks, Villa Borghese. Fountains, joggers, children playing. You walk and you come upon a white Renaissance villa. Galleria Borghese. It contains one of the most beautiful art collection of the Renaissance. Impressive to look at, this building will make you want to wear tight corsets or park your horse at the entrance. Cardinal Scipione Borghese was a passionate art collector and a nephew of Pope Paul V. In the 17th century, he commissioned the construction of a small but elegant residence, where he could exhibit the extraordinary works of art belonging to the family. Treasures from the Greek and Roman periods were added over time, along with exceptional Renaissance sculptures and paintings from the likes of Bernini or Caravaggio. All collected thanks to the contribution of other members of the Borghese family. The gallery was meant to evoke a new golden age of art and spirit. And it still does. Enter and be mesmerized by the colored marble from floor to walls to frescoes and the intricately decorated roofs. Here, along with the sculptures of Bernini and the paintings of Caravaggio's, there are works by Antonio Canova, Perugino, Bellini and Raphael. There are masterpieces such as the Venus or the Lady with Unicorn by Raphael, the enigmatic Amor Sano e Amor Profano by Tiziano, and the Hunting of Diana by Domenichino. Despite the impressive number of treasures you see here, most of the pieces from the classical age were sold to Napoleon and today are part of the Borghese Fund of the Louvre Museum in Paris. If you love mythology, this is the best place to go in Rome. 
What's fascinating about mythology here is how ancient and contemporary culture combine. The stories of mythological characters take on the culture of the time in which they are painted. The paintings become commentary. It's art, it's satire, it's blasphemy, it's everything. Or in a different era, it's controversial. It's quite haunting to see how rape culture was part of the culture. Many times when a painting is titled The Hunt of a Woman, it actually means the kidnapping or rape. The incredible sculpture of Apollo, God of War, and Daphne, nymph of the Olympus, shows Daphne turning into a tree and trying to escape Apollo. The myth is recounted as a story of love, but the punishment for Apollo's wrongdoings was that he would fall madly in love with Daphne, yet would never be able to get her. He goes crazy and stalks her. Bernini's sculpture, to me, provokes a commentary on consent. It's disturbing, but the work of the artist is meticulous. The leaves look perfect, like they're about to fall. Yet, they're made of one of the hardest stones. The nearest metro station is Piazza di Spagna, which will give you the chance to check out the Spanish steps. A magnificent stairway named after the Spanish embassy in the piazza. Get your ticket for Galleria Borghese in advance on the website and check if there's a guest artist that month. The permanent exhibition is incredible and will take you from Bernini to Da Vinci and back again. Sometimes they have modern artists as a contrast to this. Recently, Galleria Borghese hosted the eclectic and very famous Damien Hirst, who displayed his aquatic sculptures next to the old white marble ones. Past meets future, contemporary pieces next to the 15th century paintings by Caravaggio, and the impressive thing is that they didn't even feel as though they were conceived so many centuries apart. After your visit, take a walk in the park and see how Roman life goes on between the trees. You can either stop at the cute little cafe called Casina del Lago in the park, or bring a picnic and eat on the grass under a pine tree. A new golden age of art and spirit. There are two galleries in Rome that belong to the principates of the city. And these two I'm about to tell you about still belong to the families that created them centuries ago. Galleria Doria Panfili and Palazzo Colonna are majestically ostentatious and a must-do if you're into art. Let me paint a picture for you. Imagine an indoor pool with incredibly high ceilings and sky-high windows. You see blue everywhere. Blue water, blue walls, blue ceilings. Blue everywhere. Now, think of the blue as gold. You have it. This is not an actual indoor pool, but the reflection on the golden roofs and ceilings create a visual effect which makes it look like you're walking into a golden pool. Galleria Doria Panfili is an opulent gallery found between Via del Corso and Via della Gatta in Campo Marzio neighborhood. It's just a small part of a huge building. If you didn't know it was there, you'd miss it. It looks like nothing in particular if you're just walking around the city. Pamfili was one of the most influential families of the time. Going back to their family tree is as intricate as the ornaments you will see on the walls and roofs of this villa. During the Renaissance, Rome was all about rich and influential families mostly with connections to the cardinals and popes. Originally from Umbria, two family members came to Rome and quickly became very rich and powerful. A few marriages to the right people increased their power even more, so much so that the Pamfili family raised their coat of arms on the pediment of their house, a dove with an olive branch in its beak, surmounted by three golden lilies. The villa was commissioned in 1644, right after Giovanni Battista Pamfili was elected Pope. His name was Pope Innocent X. It was expanded in the 1600s, so much that it became the most important palazzo in Rome, larger even than some of the royal palaces across Europe. 
If you're intrigued by papal gossip, I suggest you listen to the Vatican episode in this Rome guide. The Doria Pamphili Gallery is a work of art of its own. It is home to one of the most prestigious private art collections in the world, built over the centuries by the merging of powerful noble families. It could be said that this is the product of the most impressive wedding gift registry ever. Inside, you'll find Velázquez, Raffaello, Tiziano, Parmigianino, Perhaps the most impressive work of art in the collection is Velázquez's portrait of Pope Innocent X. The pleat and color of his robes, his expression peering out at you, you'll be drawn to stop and stare at him. Velázquez didn't try to soften the Pope's angular face or lighten his intense expression. Try to compare the painting to Bernini's bust of Pope Innocent X, also found in the gallery. The resemblance is uncanny. However, Bernini clearly softened the Pope's expression, from certain angles almost making him appear serene. The gallery is at its best on a sunny day, when the sun hits the windows at just the right angle. The entrance fee is around 12 euros, and the gallery opens six days a week from 9 a.m. to 4 p.m., except for Wednesdays. Let me take you to another noble gallery, designed to be the most extraordinary palazzo the world has ever seen. The marble floors, the walls completely filled with portraits and paintings, the frescoed ceilings and the imposing windows, it's a dream of what once was, protected by thick stone walls. Galleria Colonna is found in Piazza dei Santi Apostoli, just off Piazza Venezia. The palazzo was built in the 14th century and occupies around three acres of land, making it the biggest noble palazzo in the city. Its art collection has been passed down from generation to generation and is still in the hands of the Colonna family. This family is supposedly descendant from a long line of nobles who have lived on this land in Rome for over a thousand years. Considered a gem of Roman Baroque, the gallery was envisioned by the architect Antonio del Grande and constructed by Bernini, Schor and Fontana. It was commissioned to be the triumphant symbol of the Christian fleet's victory over the Turks in the Battle of Lepanto in 1571. The fleet was led by Marcantonio Colonna, whom you can see painted in both the Sala Grande and the Sala della Colonna Bellica. Sala, to be clear, is the Italian word for room, and there are many salas in the Galleria Corona dedicated to displaying this extraordinary collection. The Sala della Colonna Bellica is a grand room recognizable by the red marble column at the center, which carries the crest of the Colonna family. Immerse yourself in the angelic landscape with a beautiful roof fresco of angels in the sky and admire the paintings on every wall calling Venus and love into the theme of the room. The gallery is so special that even an attempted attack on it has now become a work of art. When walking down the staircase leading to the Sala Grande, look out for a cannonball. Yes, that's right, a cannonball. It's been there since 1849, during the Second Roman Republic, a period of revolt by an insurgency against the Vatican powers. The cannonball was launched from the Gianicolo Cannon by the French armies, captained by General Oudinot, who had marched into Rome to save Pope Pius IX from the Republican rebels who had occupied the center of Rome. Once you've reached the Sala Grande, take a moment to walk through it slowly. Marble sculptures, incredible frescoes, marble floors, red, green, white, and golden. In the Sala dell'Apoteosi di Martino V, you will find the Bean Eater by Annibale Carracci, one of the world's most famous paintings, one that inspired both Van Gogh and Degas. The gallery is open to the public every Saturday morning from 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. in the afternoon, and tickets are around 12 euros per person. 
And here I have a special tip for you. If you contact the Galleria Colonna offices via email in advance, you can arrange a visit to the late Princess Isabel's apartments within the palazzo, filled with unique and priceless pieces. Ancient and Contemporary Let's say you've spent the morning at the Pantheon and have just had lunch and need to digest the carbonara you ate. You might want to have a nice walk. From the Pantheon, walk down Via della Scrofa, a historical road in town, which you will recognize from the small marble pig on the wall, which some think might be from a sculpture from 1445. Surrounded by terracotta houses and cobblestones, make your way to Arapachi's museum. This walk is about 11 minutes, but you can take it slowly and enjoy it as a Roman would. Arapachi's is where the past meets the future. Located next to the river, this museum was designed by American architect and visual artist Richard Meyer who also designed the Getty Center in Los Angeles. The building is made of steel, stone, glass and plaster and is the biggest architectural development in Rome since the fascist era. Usually, we're busy restoring rather than building. The Altar of Peace was built to celebrate Augustus' return from his campaigns in Spain and Wales. This is a masterpiece of Roman sculpture. It was made by the Roman Senate between 13 AD and 9 BC. Think of it. A building constructed in 2006 as a home for a monument that is 2,000 years old, surrounding it with modern art and photography. The museum exhibits contemporary artists and photographers in contrast with its ancient backdrop. It's hosted the art of Japanese illustrator Katsushika Hokusai, Contemporary sculptor Beverly Pepper depicted the life of legendary actor Marcello Mastroianni and so much more. Check the official website to see what's on when you arrive. Art in Rome has a deep history, thousands of years, and the city makes space for all of it. The conversation between old and new, ancient and modern is encouraged and you won't see a dialogue designed exactly this way anywhere else in the world. This is how Rome does art. Another less popular but equally fascinating museum is the Centrale Montemartini, where marble statues are displayed against the backdrop of a 1960s thermoelectric factory. It's in Ostiense, a quirky and artsy neighborhood of Rome. It's much quieter here and mainly frequented by the locals. Take the metro to Piramide, where you can also stop to see the Pyramid of Cestius from ancient Roman times. Centrale Montemartini is for true art nerds, or those who aspire to be. Their exhibitions range from colors of Rome, showing the colors of mosaics of ancient Rome, to Etruscan ceramics, to the story of how light came to Rome. There are some permanent sculptures of white marble torsos, and you will be walking between steam turbines, boilers and diesel engines. Unusual eye candy. If you like the area, stay and have lunch at Marigold Roma, a cafe with a wellness history originating in the US. More about this in our pop episode in this guide or head to the charming streets of Garbatella and have a glass of wine at Mescita, or a Roman-made craft beer at Hay Hop. Also, please try their taralli, which is a bit like an Italian pretzel, typically made in the south of Italy. It will help absorb the alcohol you're drinking, and it's so good. Ostiense and Testaccio are also very famous for their fantastic street art scene. You can walk around Testaccio and eat typical Roman dishes. Check out our Eat Here episode in this guide for some suggestions. Watch out for the she-wolf. Made entirely in black and white, it stretches six stories up the side of a building in Testaccio. The work is by Belgian artist Roa, who has painted murals around the world, 
gaining a prominent place in the field of street art. The She-Wolf by Roa does not recall the motherly aspects that could lead back to the Romulus and Ramus legend. The She-Wolf is alone and has a wild appearance, as if she's looking for freedom beyond those walls that seem to compress her. The street art murals are also famous for their political messages. A popular example is one that occupies two of the facades of a building in Ostiense. It depicts a heron fishing in a polluted sea. This is the largest eco mural in Europe, painted by the Italian born artist Jena Cruz. It is called hunting pollution, and the action implied in the name is not a metaphor. The paint used to create the mural, also a product of Italy, actually breaks down nitrogen oxide in the air. The artwork itself cleans air pollution. Something revolutionary and new, quite literally painted on something old. We'll put links to all these places, including where to find the street art, in the notes for you. Rome's art scene. In the 1920s, a group of artists founded the Futurist Movement of Rome, which would go on to influence artists in the country for decades. Then the war came, and with it, trauma and resistance. Post-World War II, around the 1950s, Rome again became an artist's favorite. The new Paris, you could say. Artists like Picasso moved to Rome for a period of time to complete some work inspired by the city's beauty. In Via Margutta, you can still see his studio tucked inside a beautiful courtyard. Whilst change had begun in the Roman art scene, things really started to accelerate in the 70s. This was a time of huge political turmoil. The anti-war political sentiment grew in the US and influenced Europe particularly Paris and Rome. In the Eternal City, that took shape as a rebellion against a system that was too conservative and Catholic. Artists would hang out in their studios and in the club bar Jackie O, where you can still go today to have a drink and bask in the Dolce Vita of Rome. As it goes, culture and art changed with the ages. In a moment of revolution, many felt free to finally break out of their shells. For a thousand years, art in Rome was dictated by the Catholic Church, both a great patron of artists, but also a confinement on what art could be. Artists felt trapped. The 70s gave them permission to get out of the cage. Benefiting from the Marshall Plan economic aid, Rome in the early 60s became a fast-living city of cultural fervor and conspicuous consumption. This was the age of La Dolce Vita. Marcello, come here. Hurry up. With Via Veneto at its epicenter. It was almost like this moment gave artists the permission to fully express. A piece that truly shows this is avant-garde artist Cesare Tacchi's piece, The Disappearance of the Artist a performance art piece where from behind glass he slowly painted himself out of the spectator's vision with white paint. Probably one of the most famous artists from that time is Mario Schifano, sometimes called the father of Italian pop art. Born in a colonized Lebanon, in the 60s he joined a group of artists known as the Piazza del Popolo School. Here, he began to produce work similar to Andy Warhol's Campbell Soup, but with the Italian petrol brand Esso and Coca-Cola. These have now become emblematic pieces of Italian pop art. Schifano actually became famous for his monochromes, essentially large canvases covered in one single color. At the time, this was very innovative, and it attracted a lot of attention even from Andy Warhol, who loved the work he was doing in Rome and invited him to the factory, where Schifano actually stayed for some time. 
He was an eccentric character who drove around Rome with a Rolls Royce and had countless girlfriends. It is said that Marion Faithful left Mick Jagger for him. With his rock and roll spirit and his artistic experimentation, he truly wrote the artistic soundtrack of the time. Art in churches. In Rome, much of the art you will see is free. Churches are sort of like time capsules scattered across the city. Hundreds of little fortresses that to this day protect within their walls their own unique and special cargoes. There's something just so special about walking through a church's door. Your nose gets flooded with the delicate and spice-like notes of incense. Your eyes readjust to the dimmer lights and darker walls and the flicker of candles. Your ears get wrapped in a vacuum of semi-silence that is just so different from the cacophony of the outside world you left behind. It's a living work of art, and on the walls, some of Rome's greatest artistic treasures. It's okay to feel a little more reverent as you take it all in. That's how it's supposed to feel. Head up to the Santa Maria della Vittoria in Via 20 Settembre. It's a beautiful Baroque church from 1620 that hides Bernini's masterpiece, the statue titled Ecstasy of Saint Teresa. He himself declared it his most beautiful work, and there's more than one reason why he managed to outdo himself when sculpting it. Bernini was the most prominent sculptor of his time, favored by Pope Urban VIII of the Bernini family who allowed him complete reign over all and any commissions, as well as the papal family's full patronage. He was the boss. When Pope Innocent X, the stern pope from Doria Pamfili, succeeded Pope Urban, he quickly dismissed Bernini and took away his patronage, leaving the sculptor to work on commissions other than those of the papal state. And so, when Bernini was hired to design a family chapel inside the Santa Maria della Vittoria church, he went into full-on revenge mode and decided to create his most beautiful sculpture to date, show the new Pope what he was missing. I think that's a feeling we can all relate to. The sculpture is of Saint Therese, who described in her diary a vision she experienced of meeting an angel who pierced her heart with a flaming rod, causing her a burning sensation of both pain and pleasure. You'll find her at the left of the altar, and if it seems too dark, there's a little box in which to put a coin in to turn on the lights. From Bernini to another favorite son of Rome, Caravaggio. Visitors come from all around the world on a pilgrimage to view his art in person. There are around 25 of his paintings hanging throughout Rome, but let me tell you about a few you shouldn't miss. My personal favorite Caravaggio is the calling of St. Matthew. The Church of San Luigi dei Francesi, found in the piazza with the same name, has been the National Church of France in Rome since 1589. It is around the corner from one of my favorite coffee spots, Barre Eustacchio. The majority of his artwork is an ode to France and its saints, both inside and out. The facade is decorated with statues of French historical figures like Charlemagne. But there's one true reason, above all others, why this church is so special. The masterpieces. Not one, not two, but three Caravaggios, all in one place. The Martyrdom of St. Matthew, St. Matthew and the Angel, and the Calling of St. Matthew. I get chills thinking about them. The Martyrdom of St. Matthew was probably the hardest for Caravaggio, as he had never painted on such a large canvas. But his use of light in the paintings was revolutionary. When the paintings were unveiled in 1600, 
Caravaggio completely changed the artistic balance in Rome by effectively ending the late Renaissance period of painters known as Mannerists. Think Raphael and Da Vinci with their incredibly delicate featured people. Caravaggio's chiaroscuro, his studies of the human body, of its muscles and shadows, of the crude reality of life and death won over the younger artists in the capital, earning him the title of the most famous artist in Rome. His use of light and shadows also works fantastically well in churches. Their usually dim lights and dark settings mean that his chiaros, his whites, and his pales can be seen from far away, much clearer than any mannerist painting. See, I told you the experience of art inside these churches was about more than just the paintings. There is also something special about the implied respect one shows when walking into any sacred place, where your voice lowers and you slow down to really take in what you're looking at. It's as if the paintings too become sacred. The statues are marveled at in quiet contemplation, only the soft echo of nearby whispers crossing the air. Something truly marvelous and unusual for a city like Rome is what the gallerist Gavin Brown has done. Sant'Andrea de Scafis is a deconsecrated church turned into a modern art gallery. Modern meets classic meets sacred meets profane. This is how Rome does art. Rome's art scene is a fascinating lens through which to see how the eternal city has evolved and adapted, incorporated new ideas and been influenced by the old ones. It is also a way to understand the difficulty of trying to do something new in a city that has already done almost everything. Thanks for listening to our art episode in Rome. Remember to check out the other Rome episodes in this guide for deeper dives into food, film, La Dolce Vita, and much more. If you're heading to Rome right now, in the near future, or would just like to learn all about a place we truly love, you'll get instant access to the full guide, plus new episodes on a regular basis when you subscribe to Circa. Find us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or download the Circa app, where you can also get pictures and maps and notes to the places in this episode and more. Maybe you'll want to sample our guides from Mexico City, London, New York, LA, and many, many more to come. Circa. Love the world you live in and we'll help you explore it.